throughout the business community statewide. We've been trying to navigate these uh, unprecedented times and the challenges due to the uh, coronavirus outbreak. And the chamber is working to keep you informed as much as possible. And as part of that, I'm going to introduce Dr. Joe Thompson, the head of ACHI, the Arkansas Center for Health Initiatives, in just a minute. But before we do that, here are a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, everybody's mic is muted, and we will accept questions from the audience through the chat feature on your screen. And you can type your questions in there, and we'll get to as many of them as we, as we can. We're scheduled to hold this to an hour. And then we'll distribute the video sometime tomorrow and make it available to you and to others as, uh, as, they, as they wish. Now, let me introduce Joe Thompson, Dr. Joe Thompson, President and CEO of the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement. This is the healthcare policy engine for our state, and it's been operating for, it's now in its third decade. And Dr. Thompson has been in charge of it and running it for most of that time. He's also served as the state's uh, inaugural uh, Surgeon General and has served under both Democrat and Republican governors in that role. He is a pediatrician and a professor in the College of Medicine, Colleges of Medicine and Public Health at UAMS. So with that, let me introduce my friend and the expert on all things coronavirus, Dr. Joe Thompson. Randy, thank you for having me. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this afternoon. You'll notice Randy and I are appropriately distanced Wait. here, uh, trying to have our social distancing. Uh, we're here at the Arkansas Center for Health Improvement offices where much of our employee base is doing a practice run of working from home, so it's a little bit lean. But we wanted to take an opportunity, and, and what I'll try to do is in the first 10 or 15 minutes, share with you from my perspective where we are and what's coming at us. There's a great deal of information. There is a great deal of uncertainty. There is a great deal of, of anxiety bordering on panic in certain situations. And we wanted to take this opportunity today on March the 18th, Wednesday, to give you an update and an interpretation of, of what we see. Uh, we anticipate this is going to change. I'm afraid it's gonna change for the worse before we get to the better. And we look forward to providing you some periodic updates uh, coming forward. What I'd like to do for those of you on the uh, on your video screens is share some, a few slides. For those of you on the telephone that don't have a video screen, we'll talk you through this so you know what we're, we're seeing. Um, as of most recently, if we can go to the first set of slides. Um, uh, here we go. So this is currently the, the state as of yesterday uh, for the outbreak of COVID-19. A little over 7,000 cases nationwide, over 100 deaths in the United States. Uh, we're well over 140,000 uh, 140, infections worldwide uh, with approximately five to 6,000 deaths. Uh, I want to emphasize what COVID-19 is. It is a new virus. Uh, it's one of the coronaviruses. There are several coronaviruses that infect humans. The common cold is one, but this is a new virus that has been transmitted probably from animals to humans, and now is transmitting from humans to humans nationwide. Because it's a new virus, a new strain of the coronavirus, none of our immune systems have ever seen it before. So none of us have any immunity or any protection against this virus. And that's why the concern is so great in a pandemic with worldwide spread, that it has the capacity to spread quickly for us to get sick and for us to overwhelm the healthcare system that we're dependent upon in our time of greatest need. And that's really the greatest threat. This is the threat and this is the reason that you see steps being taken through quarantine, through cancellation of events, through social distancing, through work at home efforts, through new employer and family-based uh, actions uh, that can diminish your chance of catching it quickly and to spread this out over time. It is unknown what the history of this virus is gonna be because it's not been here before. It is plausible that this virus is gonna stay with us for a while and that at some point we'll all be infected or at least exposed. Now I think importantly, there are kind of three groups of people here that are being infected by the coronavirus. 
One group are those that become sick and may need hospitalization and present to their hospital or their physician and get tested. There's another group who are probably a larger group that have cold-like symptoms, may not get tested, but are infected by the coronavirus. And then there's a third group that are asymptomatic. They never know they're infected, but they are infected and can spread the condition. Right now, most of our testing is on that former group, those who are sick, who are presenting for care. And what this leads to is some of the uncertainty about how widespread this is, how severe this illness is, and we'll touch on that in a few minutes. Now here in Arkansas, we are having a daily update. Uh, if I can have the next slide, Sandra. A daily update on the number of confirmed cases. Uh, as of a week ago, we only had one case uh, at Pine Bluff due to a travel-related exposure for Mardi Gras. Uh, we now, as of today, reported by the health department, have a total number of 33 confirmed cases. There are two ways that you'll hear described the spread. One is a known contact, so an individual that was known to have the virus exposed other people. For example, some of the healthcare workers in Jefferson County have subsequently become positive because they had contact there. The other is when there's not a known case and you just picked it up in the community somehow. You got exposed to somebody who may have been asymptomatic, may have had minor cold symptoms, or may have actually had more severe symptoms but didn't know they were infected yet, and you became infected through what's called community spread. As of today, confirmed cases by the health department, either through their direct testing or the, through commercial labs, suggest that these dozen counties have 33 cases, again, most concentrated in central Arkansas, with the first case today being reported uh, in Fayetteville out of northwest Arkansas. Now, these are the confirmed cases with a positive test. On the next slide are the number of tests that have been done that are negative. In other words, these are people who probably had symptoms, who went in for testing, and they ended up having the flu or the common cold or something else. It's not to diminish the number of important cases that we have and the severity of this condition, but it's just to say that every cold is not the COVID virus, and, and this, these are uh, negative tests from around the state. Now, I'm telling you what I would call our numerator events. These are people that have become positive. The real question is, what, is, what are the characteristics of this disease? And on the next slide, I wanna put out four important questions that I think it's, impo it's important for us to understand. First is, how readily does this new coronavirus spread? How likely is it that I'm here with Randy and Randy's gonna come down with it if I'm infected with it? The scientific name for this is the rho or R sub zero or R naught, you hear different names, and it is the number of people an infected individual is likely to infect themselves. And right now, the numbers that the public health officials are putting on this new coronavirus is about 2.5. So for every person who's infected, they will likely affect, infect 2.5 people. And if you do the math, 2.5 people, then each infect another 2.5 and another 2.5, and you'll see how fast this thing could possibly grow pretty quick. Now, that's how infectious it is. The next important question is how deadly is it? How much of a severe illness is this gonna cause? Scientifically, this is known as the case fatality rate or the proportion with the infection who ultimately die from it. Again, we know the number of people who have died. Luckily, that is zero in Arkansas. Unfortunately, I think we will have tallies in that column at some point in the future but we don't necessarily know how many are infected with it and maybe asymptomatic. So on both of these numbers, we know the numerator of it, the number of people who've been infected in the former, but not necessarily, or the number of people who are, have symptoms in the former, but not necessarily the number that are infected. And in the second, we know the number of people who have died or have not died from it, but not the number who are uh, infected there. So what I'm tracking is the number of negative cases and how much we can gain information about the denominator as we know, the numerator is going to continue to grow. We know we're going to have more people with the infection, and we know that, unfortunately, we're likely to have some with severe illness that succumb to the infection. Now, the third question is, who's at most risk for these adverse effects? Because of the experience in other countries and the growing experience in our country, we know that the individuals who are most affected by this tend to be older, that is, older than age 60 and for sure older than age 80, and those individuals that have 
chronic conditions that place them at in increased risk, largely those with pulmonary conditions because the, the virus causes a pneumonia, or those that have immune compromised situations, either those with an Im immunodeficiency disease or those that may be on chemotherapy and have a suppressed immune system. So those individuals, older individuals, those with pulmonary complications, those with immunosuppression, we need to try to protect. And we'll come back to that about what individuals or employers could do there. Now, finally, how do we limit the risk? There are really three major ways that we're doing this, and, and this is what I would like to ask uh, for your assistance in moving each of these three forward. The first are individual actions. We can increase actions that we individually take that decrease the likelihood of us becoming infected and therefore likely transmitting it to others. First and foremost is the regular and frequent action of daily hand washing, actually frequent hand washing, multiple times a day. How many times? I, I would say in, anytime you're changing your location, you go out, you come back, think about washing your hands. Now, a secondary option there are the uh, uh, hand sanitizers which do work if they are more than 60% alcohol, but hand sanitizers are still gonna be secondary to a good 20 or 30 second hand washing with soap and water, where the water is washing away whatever the virus you may have picked up. Most of the ways that we transmit this virus are through what we believe are respiratory droplets, somebody who's coughing or sneezing, and they sneeze and those respiratory droplets get aerosolized and they're in the air, and if you're within about six feet, there's a likelihood that you're going to be exposed to it. So that's where the second piece of social distancing comes from, to try to put space between you and a potentially infected individual. So hand washing first, social distancing second. I think there are some other actions that people can take. If, if you're at a desk, you know, periodically, a few times a day, wiping down your desk, wiping down your computer, keyboard, your, your arm rests on your chair, not handshaking anymore. Let's do an elbow bump if you have to, not communicate the virus with a normal handshake, and that's hard to do. Uh, if you don't like an elbow bump, maybe an ankle, you know, dance or something like that. That's too complicated. It recognizes it. Uh, other individual actions that one can take is if you have a loved one or a neighbor or a known individual that is in that higher risk group or has a potential complication, really think twice about going and personally visiting them because every person that they come in contact with increases their likelihood for becoming infected. So those are individual actions that I would highly recommend each and every one of you communicate to your employees, practice in your family, share with your neighbors. The collective action we all found out about as they canceled the SEC conference last week uh, and subsequently the start of Major League Baseball next week and the NBA season for the rest. These are large group events where people were going to come together for an enjoyable, but not necessarily a critically required event, and the risk of transmission to a large number of people were great. So the collective action was to cancel events originally at that large size, and increasingly as the risk has gone up, we have moved that to smaller and smaller sizes now, uh, where for sure activities with events more than 50 people should be avoided. Some are now taking that number down to 10. Uh, this room that we're in here, Last week, we would have had a staff meeting with 30 people in this room. We're no longer having those large meetings. We're communicating via te technology. We're using telemedicine. As I mentioned, my team is doing a practice day at home to see what we can get done there. Other collective action you're starting to see uh, happen include issues around conserving uh, uh, personal protection equipment for healthcare workers. Some of the drive-through testing so that you don't go into the clinic to be tested, but you actually uh, come through. Uh, I think one of the collective actions that I would ask of employers is that the direction is not to seek medical care if you think you have symptoms. The, the direction is for you to self-quarantine in your home and to contact the health department or your healthcare provider if you think that you need to be monitored. Home monitoring, because most people are gonna be asymptomatic or have mild symptoms, is going to be what most of us experience in the treatment for this disease. Uh, for those who have severe symptoms, risk factors, or for whom their symptoms are pulmonary, difficulty breathing, that's when you should seek medical attention. And you should call ahead and say, I'm coming, so that you don't end up infecting the waiting room or other folks uh, while you're there. And finally, the third effort that you see on the news and see reported are public health actions. 
Originally, this included quarantine of individuals that were at risk. Uh, that has spread to now include you know, shutdowns of transportation and communication, closure of uh, borders, uh, even some communities recommending folks shelter at home so that they don't get out at all. The avoidance of bars and restaurants where you have a lot of contact with individuals that you're not usually around. So that's a cauldron, if you will, for the potential of infection. Currently, there is not a medical treatment for this virus. There is no drug that treats it. There's no vaccine for it. Uh, those are public health <coughs> options that are underway. Uh, people are trying different current antiviral drugs to see if some of those work. There are development of new drugs. There are the studies of individuals who have recovered from this disease to see what their antibodies look like, to see if we can develop antibodies that look like what would be effective. And over time, if the disease stays, as I think it will, we will develop a vaccine, but that's a long stage process. If you're gonna inject a healthy person with something that is gonna stimulate their immune system, you gotta have a safety trial first, and then you have to have an effectiveness trial second. So those are things going forward. So I think that the only other question that's not up here, and it's largely because you're not seeing much information about this, is when is this virus infected from the start to the finish? We don't have yet enough experience to know how early it is that you're infectious or how long it is downstream that you can remain infectious. We know that symptoms start as early as about two days from infection, that they are, that most people are showing signs and symptoms by five days, and that by day 14 or for sure day 21, your infectiousness is likely over. But we don't know if we can squeeze those days into a more narrow window to better be able to manage and monitor risk. We got a few videos here that I'd like to show you. This first one, these come from, sorry, one more graph. These are of all the recent scares with viral diseases and where coronavirus fits. Along the bottom, the x-axis is how infectious something is. And along the vertical or the y-axis is how fatal it is. Usually virus, and, and you'll see, the higher it is, the more deadly, the farther to the right, the faster it spreads. Viruses have these two characteristics, and if a virus spreads really fast, like measles or chickenpox, it's usually not that deadly, because if it were, it would burn itself out. Mm -hmm. Viruses that are very, very deadly, like Ebola and the bird flu, you'll see they have almost 100% fatality rate. They don't spread that much because they kill their host. This virus is somewhere in this shaded area where it looks like about two and a half people for every in infected individual will get sick. And right now, the fatality rate, they are estimating somewhere between 1% and 2%. Now, I think the fatality rate will go down as we grow the denominator by asymptomatic individuals, but that's where it is right now. And this puts other conditions like measles and chickenpox that are very infectious, but not very deadly out here on the right and in the bottom. Bird flu and Ebola, which are very deadly, but don't spread because they kill their hosts up on the upper left. And this current virus, the new coronavirus, is estimated to be somewhere in the mid-range here. Fairly infectious and fairly serious, particularly for those that have comorbidities or that are older uh, in age. That's a terrific chart. It's very informative. I think it gives people a lot of perspective. I think what we'll try to do over time is that shaded area uh, that's in pink, which is yeah. where the estimates are, that is gonna get tighter and tighter. It right. will have more and more information about how to manage this uh, going forward from, a, from an economic perspective, from a population perspective, and so forth. Let's go one more slide, Sandra. So this is actually from the Washington Post. You'll see this is an infected individual touching everybody in a free-for-all. At the top, you'll see in orange the number of infected individuals, in blue the number of non-infected individuals, and pretty soon everybody gets infected. Now remember, go back to our three groups. Some people will recover asymptomatically and never know they were infected. Some people will have a cold and know I was sick and may have got tested and they'll know they were infected. And unfortunately, some people will have serious illness. They may even have pneumonia. They may need to be put on oxygen or extreme cases of ventilator. And if too many people are in that latter condition at the same time, that's what we're worried about overwhelming our healthcare system. So this is an example of if it was a free-for-all, if we'd taken no steps so far, what it would look like, and we would probably be, you know, in significant trouble because of the rapid spread of this new virus for which none of us have any immunity to. This next graphic is also, this is from 
This is a statistical visualization of what we're trying to do. Uh, you've heard about flattening the curve. You'll see if, it, if we weren't doing any steps, we would have a lot of people get sick and that purple space would be the people that were hit in the hospital and overwhelming the system. If we can flatten that curve and spread it out, our hospitals will be able to take care of them and we'll be able to keep people in the green space well treated with low mortality as opposed to in the purple space where we overwhelm the healthcare system and we will lose people that we otherwise would not have to lose as this virus takes its course. That's basically what's happened in Italy, right? This is what happened in Italy, what originally happened in Wuhan, in China. Uh, what is, I think, a fear of many countries around the world, if we don't take these actions, we will have that high spike on the front end and the purple people, no pun intended, but the people that have serious illness and so many of them hit the healthcare system, we won't be able to take care of everybody. We're still gonna have people with serious illness, even in the green space but we can manage them better. We can protect our healthcare force, workforce more easily if we manage the pipeline of problems coming at us. And that's what this is about. So how do we manage those pipelines? The next one is an attempt to quarantine individuals over on the right and say, okay, if you've been exposed, we're gonna keep you pent up. But inevitably you can't keep everybody quarantined forever. And you get escape into the community and you're gonna have, even with quarantine of individuals who know they may have been exposed, this is where the community spread starts in. You don't know that you were exposed, but somebody who either has the symptoms and does not know that they're ill or is asymptomatic exposes you, and you go down this path. So this is what quarantine you'll see at the top. You're keeping more people healthy longer. You're spreading the sick people out over a flatter curve. Ultimately, you do get escape out into the community and you start having more sick people coming in and ultimately most people will end up with this with the purple represented by those who recover. Uh, we have not depicted deaths on this, uh, but obviously a certain proportion would end up uh, succumbing to the illness. Finally, as we have gone to social distancing, so this is slowing people's ability to get around. You see what happens when we, for example, send kids home and they're not in school anymore, they're home. This slows that spread, it flattens that curve, it allows, the illness that is going to require the healthcare system to respond to be spread out over time. And this really is a effective mechanism for delaying the spread and the impact of this virus. And that's where we are with schools being closed, you know, with employers being asked to consider work from home or other strategies, with the closure of bars and restaurants. This is what we are now doing is we're, we're every one of those persons is somebody out in our community. We're saying stay home and stay put those of us that still have to work or go to the grocery store or go to the pharmacy or take care of people are still moving, but the likelihood for spread is much less. Now, the last one we in Arkansas have not gone to yet, but uh, this is an extensive, this would be a, a, a preemptive kind of sheltering place that San Francisco or New York, San Francisco is, tr is trying, New York is considering. This is, if you're not absolutely essential, you stay at home. And you see what it does to the, to the curve. Uh, and it just flattens it out so that we can manage it over time. Let me go back to those questions. The more infectious this virus is, so the faster it spreads, and the more severe the illness and the more likely that case fatality rate is going higher. If either of those two are high, the more we need to do what you see in front of us now. We need to isolate, shelter, and take precautions. We're not there yet. Uh, but I think this is just forecasting what may happen so that as you hear people talking about this, you can put in context where Arkansas is. I go back to where we are in this state. We have 30 known cases now in 10 or 12 counties. We're taking precautions to try to slow things down. We will increasingly have line of sight on what those denominator numbers are so that we can make more informed decisions. And I'm impressed by our state leadership and both the public and the private sector for the steps that we're taking rapidly to you know, mitigate and try to minimize the negative impact of this virus. So with that, we're, we're gonna try to keep folks updated on our website. We're putting stuff out. Randy, I'll turn it over to you. Open to any questions. There is a lot we don't know. There's a lot of this that's logic, it's not science. Uh, and there's a lot of it that's gonna continue to emerge. And if we can cut through some of the noise and help people have more understanding. I hope we can alleviate some of the anxiety and probably alleviate some of the chaos that we're experiencing in our local communities. Joe, let me let me kind of tee up what I sure. think is the general 
widespread concern of this particular, particularly employers. How do I protect my employees? How do I keep as many of my employees as possible working? What are the things that a business can do to make be as sure as possible? And if there's no certainty, it's hard to come by in this conversation in this environment. But what can I do if I'm operating a manufacturing plant, for instance, or if I'm operating a retail store where my where my employees are susceptible to the general public, but particularly the manufacturers have been the ones that have been really concerned about how do I keep my team together, how do I keep my people paid. I know that's that's that whole yep. fiscal and, and uh, government response. And uh, again, as you said, I think the governor and his team get absolutely gold star marks. They have done a fantastic job of figuring out how to fix the locks as quickly as possible, and that's absolutely true on the federal level as well. The feds are pumping money into the system to keep the banking system functioning, and all those things are succeeding. But at the end of the day, if I'm a business owner with 10 employees, <laughs> how do I make sure first I protect them and how do I keep them working if possible? So I think it's a great question, and you allude to one of the challenges that we'll come back to is that you know, our employers in Arkansas are diverse. Some have a lot of public exposure, some have almost no public exposure. Right. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to some of the specifics around those subgroups in a moment. I would go back to those three levels that every employer can both take and encourage their employees to be aware of and to take this as first with individual action. The employer and every one of their employees needs to know, communicate, communicate to their family, hand washing, social distancing, minimizing unnecessary contact. You know, we have to go on and live our lives, but there are a lot of parts of our lives that are not as necessary as other parts. They can wait. And, and they can wait. So, so I think employers need a communication strategy with every one of their employees about how each employee takes responsibility for their own individual actions and that you reinforce that at the work site. If you've got somebody you know, that you're working close to that's coughing and sneezing and whatever, you know, the employer needs to be able to suggest, you ought to go home for a day or two to see how this is going to evolve. So you know, I think those are some issues that are individual, personal responsibility. If I'm feeling bad, tell your employees, don't come to work today, right? Let's see if this evolves. Wash your hands, hand sanitizer, wiping stuff down, limiting your contact. Those are individual actions. Then collective actions, if you're an employer and you have regular meetings, you've got places where people are working in close contact, anticipate how you can spread those people out, the social distancing by an employer. We've already seen most employers cancel or postpone travel out of state if not necessary. Um, I think we have, and I think others, if you've got visitors that the business can be conducted over a televideo, conference or something like that, that's another way to minimize contact but still get work done. If you're in an employment base or manufacturing environment, you know, making sure that, that you've got spread where you can. Uh, I think, you know, from a public policy, public health perspective, you know, employers have some opportunities there in that they can look to make sure that their insurance benefit, if they offer that, is going to offer testing for COVID-19. Um, that your leave benefits, that people are aware this is what that's for, is if you've got sick leave and you're sick, don't come infect everybody else. Stay home. Um, and then finally, you know, I think it's important for employers to recognize this is mentally stressful on all of us, and in particularly their employees. Their employees are probably having spousal employment issues that are changing. Their kids are now home from school. We've got daycares that are increasingly closing. That's putting stress on those family units that right. they're bringing it to work. Right. You know, there are opportunities for employers to offer to their employees, particularly if you're working multiple shifts, can y'all switch shifts to offer, you know, daycare or childcare that's less stressful on you that we wouldn't think about as an employer, but it may work that two families that are working at the same place could actually juggle a little bit and make some of that. I, I think you hit the nail on the head. This is what we've been urging throughout the, through all the community chambers and their communications network. Be specific, be yep. communicating, people trust their employers, talk to your employees, do everything you possibly can to make it possible for people to continue to work reasonably safely. 
and, and take care of their families at the same time. I, I think we've got uh, Steve Barron on the line for a question. How do we handle this? Um, Just a... Hold on. Can you hear me, Randy? Yes. Go uh, ahead, Steve. Uh, Dr. Thompson, thank you for taking the time to do this. Some of our, we're in the retail business. We've got convenience stores. And one of the guys asked about what if one of his employees at a convenience store gets the virus? Does he have any responsibilities to report to? What should he do in that case? Good so, question. Yeah, great question. And, and this kind of gets into some of the types of different businesses that, that we have around the state. Right. You know, I think convenience stores are one of those that have you know, a high degree of public traffic and therefore do have you know, an increased risk of having an exposure at one point in time or another. So let's start with how to prevent it in that space, and then we'll get to your specific question of what if one of your employees comes down with it. So I think we're seeing you know, places where there's a high degree of public traffic, your retail stores, your grocery stores, your convenience stores. Number one, I think you need to double up on the cleaning and the disinfecting that's going on on your stores, in, you know, on places that the public has contact, your restrooms, your door handles, you know, your, your, your ice boxes in the back that everybody's opening. You know, several times a day, just wipe those down to diminish that. At the checkout counter, you know, I went and got a barbecue sandwich for lunch today. I signed the Visa card with a pin that was tied to the to the countertop, and I started thinking, you know, everybody who's come in today has used that same pin. You know, encouraging people to use their own pin if they've got one in their pocket. You know, that wiping the counter down, there is the potential for contact. So if somebody sneezes and that droplet gets on your counter for a period of time and you come along with your hands and then you touch your eye, that is a mechanism for contact. So the disinfecting of contact surfaces is important first thing. Let's say that one of your employees does now come down with COVID-19 symptoms. Ideally, you would have already talked to them and when they came down with symptoms, they would call you up that day and you would understand, hey, I've got cold symptoms that are consistent with COVID-19, the employee, should say, I'm gonna stay at home. Hopefully you would say you should stay at home. And so you take that individual out of the, of the practice. Right now, the state has a limited number of tests. So for a period of time, the recommendation would be for that individual if they didn't have worsening symptoms or pulmonary issues, respiratory difficulty, for them to self quarantine at home and to manage their own care with cold medicines and things like that. Uh, you as an employer, I think it would be appropriate for you to report to the Department of Health that you think you have an employee that may have these symptoms. Beyond that, the responsibility really shifts to the individual, the healthcare provider, and the Department of Health to do the contact tracing and to do the follow-up. Your responsibility, I think, on the front is to try, to try to provide as much protection from infection in the environment that you have and to isolate individuals who may have symptoms out of your store as quickly as possible. Okay, I get it, Steve? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, uh, here's another one, Joe. Uh, what can employers do to support public health responses to coronavirus? Well, I think, again, this gets some back to, you know, we have got to keep our employers <clears throat> that are publicly facing for critical needs, food, pharmacy, you know, healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, other services. Police, that, fire. Uh, police, fire, uh, you know, social support services. You know, we've got to keep those employers operating. There are some logical steps. These are not things that have science behind them, but I think it's logic. We've seen some of our grocery stores add cleaning at night to disinfect the floors, the cash registers, the, the, the checkout stands. And we have seen them offer to open for senior citizens for the first hour, the first two hours during the day. What that does is it lets those of us that are most at risk have the most protection from the cleaning investment that those retailers have put into effect. So I think those are some things that employers can do. I think employers, again, the messaging to individuals about individual hygiene and appropriate action if you have symptoms. Uh, I think some of the collective action, restricting travel, um, you know, internal workforce issues of, of having fewer meetings, having more tele, telecommunication facilitation. Uh, sitting as you and I are six feet away, uh, not being in a small office with three people having a meeting, but say, all right, let's let's be smart here. Yeah, and and I think those are things that employers, 
you know, can and should, you know, uh, respond to. There are some in our employer group that are going to be hurt by this. Restaurants, bars, those for whom their, their uh, service is more optional, and we will have fewer of those. Uh, I'm encouraging many of our local restaurateurs to really get out and articulate, advertise the carryout functions that they have, because that's not the way most of us have gone to these restaurants. I'm surprised at the number of people that work for me here, how many are trying to find a source of food for dinner because they've forgotten how to cook. I mean, so I, I think there are some options here that businesses can respond to, but it's a different business model. It's a yeah. model of providing a service in a way that doesn't have gatherings of individuals. I think the watchword there is the most creative and flexible and innovative providers in whatever sector you're talking about are the ones that are going to that are going to come out on the other side of this fastest and invest in this show. There are big opportunities uh, that are buried in all of this uh, long term. So that, I think that's something for business people to keep in mind. How should we respond as businesses to public actions like school closings or some of the broader impact issues? You know, a month ago, we were cruising along with some of the highest stock market, you know, uh, uh, I'm not even looking prices. Uh, our kids were going to school. We had, yeah. you know, basketball events and, and you know, uh, all sorts of sporting activities coming up. And it's just a different world today. It's a different world. Actually, for most employers, you may be the most stable so far of your employees' entire life experience because their travel's been restricted, their kids are at home, their daycare has been disrupted, they can't go see their parents, they're not allowed to see their parents in a nursing home now. Right. So all of these are stressors on family units that are statewide. And I think it's important for employers in as many different ways as you can to just acknowledge that that is, that is true that we're going to all react in ways that you usually don't see because we're under such stress. And having an understanding there is, I think, important as an employer to know that as a supervisor for those that, that you have closer contact with. I think the other thing that employers could and should do, as we've talked about before, some of the individual safety actions, some of the special practices, depending on how much public exposure you have, um, some of the benefit issues in as you see the state relaxing some of the Medicaid or uh, supplemental nutrition programs to have a little more flexibility for employers to consider where they can give more flexibility to try to do that to help manage the stress that their employees are under. There's certainly a lot more flexibility around unemployment insurance mm -hmm. and, and every effort I know is being made to first of all eliminate the waiting period and to, to get people on the system right. and, and getting some money as quickly as possible. I might also add, Rand, you know, if if an employer does, and I think we will have some that will have to go through a reduction in force or, or, or activities like that, you know, employees have a pretty tight relationship with their employer most of the time. Mm -hmm. And we're in a period, because of the social distancing, people are getting very isolated. So maintaining, even if you don't still have that employment relationship, maintaining a communication relationship so that when things turn around and the economy and the opportunities are coming back, that employee still has a relationship with the employer so that they may be able to reconnect in an employment situation because they maintain a social connection through this stressful time period. I think that's a key point because it hasn't been but about two, maybe three weeks when all I was hearing was I can't find enough people to hire. Right. And right now it's a totally different conversation, but it's critical to try to maintain that relationship so that as things normalize and we get back to something like a normal uh, business setting that, that you're able to get your work team back together. So that, that's good advice. And, and I saw a survey earlier this week that employers are one of the most trusted sources of information because there is so much and so many different sources and so much different information that's out you know, on the 24 hour a day, seven day a week news drives. Well, that's what a lot of what we're trying to do through the chamber as the chamber is to make sure that our members and other employers have access to reliable information and ways to communicate that information that, that have impact. Uh, and a lot of it is just as simple as posting things. Here's what to do if. Here's how to find this. Here's having having things that are visual, even having that visual cue of yes. a pair of hands with soap on it. Yeah. 
Wash gets people to think about it a little more. You washed your hands in the last hour. Right? Yeah. You know. Okay. Is there, have we got any questions in the audience center at this point? Or? No, we just received a note from Terry saying that this was very helpful. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you or you can add them here in the chat box. Uh, let's see, one more, I think. What about uh, how to handle employees who've been on personal travel? So obviously work-related travel, for the most part, employers and the state government and the universities have, have ceased to have. Uh, personal travel, I think it is important to recognize what type of personal travel. So you got, you got the risk of being in an airplane or going through a major you know, transportation hub and being exposed to the public. Then you also have why are you going and where are you going? You know, are you going to Mardi Gras yeah. or are you going to visit, you know, uh, a family member in isolation? You know, for the most part, people that are traveling in their own individual vehicles, going to a family member somewhere else, I'll raise the question, is it necessary? Okay, but if it's necessary, for the most part, those are needed trips that should happen. I would unfortunately recommend that most people avoid public transportation for a period of time. And that's going to hurt the airline and the travel industry. But until we know what this virus's characteristics are and how big a problem we're looking at, I think that would be a strong recommendation. For employers, uh, let's start with private employers. Private employers can and uh, potentially should ask about personal travel. If not only, I, I don't know that they need to isolate or have somebody not come to work, but it's awareness. It's to say, okay, you've been out of state, you've been to a state on that U.S. map that had a high proportion of our infected cases. New York City. Pay, pay extra attention to whether you've got symptoms. And the first time you have symptoms, here's our plan. Right. Okay, so being able to have that conversation is important. I think for our public employers, I think the conversation is equally important. We may need to put some processes in place so that there's some, some safeguards so that people don't feel like they're being isolated. Uh, in a discriminatory way. And, uh, but I think private employers can ask and should ask you know, to let them know, or at least let their supervisor know, if they've been out of state and for sure if they've been in a high risk area uh, that we have broad community spread and they may not know that they've been exposed as they come back into our state and into the place of employment. And you know, reassuring people that they're gonna get paid one way or another, they're gonna get paid. And it takes a lot of anxiety out of those conversations. Uh, that, that way people are more forthcoming and they're more willing to cooperate and communicate. And I think that's the key word you were expressing there is communicate. Be sure you're talking to them. Well, and, and mm -hmm. I don't want to predict, but, but I want to at least forewarn. I think we're going to see growing numbers of both cases right. and nationally, unfortunately, people who succumb to this virus. And our goal and objective now is to slow this spread until we can get protections in place right. and so that our healthcare system can manage those that need it. Um, as you hear those numerator events, I don't want people to get more and more afraid. I want them to understand what we're witnessing and what's going into effect. And that's why I think some of those cascading dots in our, our effort to flatten the curve right. is, is most important. Sandra, I might just see in some of the comments, I might ask that we go back to that flattening of the curve so we reinforce what we're trying to do and why. Good idea. Uh, because I think you hear a lot of things that are being done, but the interpretation of the why are we doing this is not as frequently available. So if we go back to the, to the um, get this one, this Very is the good. one that's the most important. If, if, if we don't do anything, then we're gonna have that big spike with the purple area of people in our hospitals overwhelming our health by social distancing, by canceling of events, by restricting travel, by slowing our interactions down that are not necessary, we are pushing this curve off to the right so that in the green space, we can adequately treat everybody and we can minimize the mortality that this new virus is likely to cause families across the nation. Let me ask you a speculative question. We know that a vaccine could be found, identified, confirmed, and then made widely available at least a year and a half, roughly. Right. Unless some... Um, Unless yes, there's some breakthrough that nobody's yeah. anticipating. Yeah, but, but practically that's probably what we're right. doing. But there are treatments and therapies for people who are infected that could be devised, that could be put in place a little more quickly. And I know there are a lot of very smart people working on this. 
Could you kind of give those sure. general, uh, those of us in the general public, a sense of what smart people working on it looks like sure. and how widespread or intense that effort might be? So I think it's important to break up the types of treatment. You know, you know, we had hoped that some of our antiviral treatments would work against this virus. It does not appear that that's a slam dunk. So, so the drug companies, pharmaceutical companies, uh, investigators at NIH and other research entities are looking to either develop or tweak an existing antiviral drug that would be able to combat the virus in, in addition to your own immune system that is responding right. to the virus. So, right. so I think that's going to be a, a first tier issue. Uh, concurrent with that are studies going on for the people who survived this virus. What did their immune system make in terms of antibodies that helped them survive the virus where somebody else didn't? So, so the people that have been ill probably are you know, a high target for research firms now saying, okay, how did you survive this? And what does your antibody look like? See if we can make one that you could package Hold in an arm. That's right, right. that's right. Uh, you know, so I think those are the first two medical kinds of, of treatment. And then we get into the vaccine treatment. Uh, concurrently, there's work I know going on in China uh, to try to identify how did this jump from an animal to a human to start with, because mm -hmm. we need to interrupt that mm -hmm. to keep the next one of these from happening. Uh, not that that's going to happen now, but it's going to happen at some point in the future. So learning as we have this experience now so right. that we can try to avoid anything like this in the future. Uh, but that's what's happening in the research and development pipeline, I think. Uh, you really got, you got public health kind of flattening the curve efforts underway. You got health care for people that are sick underway, and you've got these treatment developments that hopefully are going to be available sooner rather than later. There are a lot of things we don't know about how infectious this virus is and how it's going to behave. Hopefully, although I wouldn't count on it, it will burn itself out like the flu does as warm weather comes. Mm -hmm. If it acts like the flu, that would be a positive. Because none of our bodies has ever seen it before, it could keep going throughout the summer and we could have an extended period of time for this as that curve flattens and we're better able to take care of people as they get sick. And underpinning all of those health activities and initiatives, you've got the enormous efforts on the federal government's part and businesses' part to finance and make sure that the economy continues to function as much as it possibly can. But we are all in this together. Uh, this is the this is the the this is the experience of why you invest in public health is because when it gets out of control and you can't control it, that's, those are the tools yeah. that come into play. Yeah. We will all be affected by this if we're not already. Uh, I would encourage each of your employers and their employees to take this seriously. Uh, these are you know, over 100 deaths from something that we didn't even know anything about two months ago. Uh, that's a pretty rapid uptick in risk. And we need to make sure that we're taking every opportunity to mitigate the risk and minimize that risk, uh, and that we're getting the benefit of the actions that we're taking. Okay, Sandra, any other questions? Uh, just that we, you guys send out a link, and we'll have all of this online. We'll I would have it online by what? what probably what? tomorrow. Tomorrow. So uh, and our, on our website here, and, here. Uh, and a link from the chamber. I would you know, encourage, and Randy, I think we've offered the. Uh, you know, this is as we are today. This thing is going to evolve. Uh, we'll be glad to do updates on our website or other mechanisms uh, and look forward to continuing to, to manage through this. We probably ought to think about doing that about a week from now. Yeah. Think about this with frequency and with bandwidth. So, anyway, that's our effort today to try to keep you as informed as possible about what can be done, what should be done, and what is being done. So, uh, tune in later. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.